The story of Ethernet is best told in personal stories shared by its very own creators, providers, and users. The Voices of Ethernet Archive is dedicated to preserving Ethernet's oral history, recording pivotal events that may have been forgotten or remain unknown through a collection of spoken records with the individuals engaged in the technology's global emergence as the foundation of Internet. Today, we're going to talk to Robert Garner. Thanks for joining us, Robert. Could you please introduce yourself? All righty. I'm Robert Garner. Uh, I've been working here in Silicon Valley since uh, 1976. Um, Bob Metcalf was the first guy to hire me. I uh, worked on the Ethernet there. And then after uh, working at Xerox Park for a while with Lynn Conway, uh, me Conway, Lynn, um, I uh, left there, went to uh, Sun Microsystems. And at Sun Microsystems, I was the co-architect of the Spark architecture and designed the first Spark machines. And I, I, Sun was an amazing place to be. And I stayed there until about 1998, uh, worked at Brocade for a little while and then went to IBM Research. And, and here I am. That's, that's sort of a fascinating journey. And you've mentioned a bunch of places with a very high profile. <laughs> and when I came out of college, because when I was in college, it was, you know, I think the top end we worked on was at Axe 11, 750. But a few years later, around about 95, I actually got to work on Spark workstations. So I actually made a living using the things that you built. <laughs> and, I was, and I did like them very much. But we were very proud of Spark because we defined it in the context of a system, the software people, you know, compiler people, OS people, uh, and some crazy people, Bill Joy and Andy Bechtelshine. And, and you know, we, we just were really proud of what we built and what we accomplished. Dave Patterson was, an amazing father figure. So, so, that, so that's like the, um, that's royal, that's a lot of the royalty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I enjoyed it. I'd, I'd live it all again. So what was the driver for you to get involved with Ethernet? What got you there and like, when was that? And like, how did that all work out? Well, it was very simple. I, um, I was at Stanford getting my master's degree and I went to a campus interview and this guy named Bob Medcalf interviewed me. <laughs> Pretty remarkable man for an interview. And he, um, he was in the process. He this is 1976. He was bringing on board his team to productize the uh, what had been accomplished the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, the, his invention of the Ethernet um, in 1973, and the creation of the the Alto personal computer uh, in 1973 and 74. So he had been given the task of hiring a team to commercialize that. And you mean you mean to bring his uh, his his idea to life? to bring his idea to the marketplace. And you know, his idea was developed inside Xerox. I mean, at that time, Xerox had a patent on it. Um, they had built probably and distributed by that time, you know, maybe a thousand altos uh, around universities at Stanford, uh, even in the House of Representatives. People could see that the networking worked and the alto worked. Um, so the, the move and the push was on to get uh, product out the door from Xerox and, and Bob. Uh, there's always, there's an interesting thing from, I had this idea, I showed yeah. it working with one or two of them, and now I succeeded, people actually want to buy them. <laughs> well, we, we thought that the world, you know, it was like we were on drugs, you know, we had this, this thing that is a personal computer as we know it today with a bitmap screen. I mean, I, I have one sitting next to me here, the Alto. Um, a network. Uh, could I just borrow it just for a little while? I promise I'll take care of it. <laughs> this is an original Alto One, which is still being. Does it still work? Uh, this one in particular is still being restored. You can go online and see about the restoration of other Altos. But you know, we we were just fascinated. Uh, it was just so compelling, so much better than you know printers and three hundred baud modem lines. Um, uh, uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, screen. Uh, laser printers. Um, we had to bring this to market, and, and Bob was part of that. He hired a top-notch team of people, uh, about half a dozen people, um, it included uh, somebody I had as an uh, instructor at Stanford, Roy Ogus, um, Ron Crane, who was an analog expert, and myself. Um, we were tasked to do the Ethernet. Now, so the original... what was it work? Because I imagine that team would have been pretty diverse in the way they did things. Like, what was it like in that environment? Well, we were actually co-resident with Park. Uh, this was actually in the system development division. Uh, we had offices we could share with the Park people. I think that's what made 
the transfer from research to development really work uh, by being rubbing shoulders. And you know, we had lunch in the park cafeteria with the, the story uh, heroes there, you know, Butler Lampson and Chuck Thacker. Uh, so we felt part of the culture. Um, Xerox Park had a lot of, <laughs> they didn't call themselves prima donnas, but everyone was brilliant. And you could just pick up the vibes. And there was also, there were two cultures there. There was so, so there's a lot of very strong personalities and people <laughs> very who believed in their their own their own way of seeing things. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And Bob was part of that. He was a great leader. He could push his ideas, um, and he was also funny. Now, there was this combination of of kind of a steely persona, and then a, a you know a, a Groucho Marx a sense of humor. And there was a, into that just for a second, right? What's that? I'm trying to I'm trying to think about it. It's like I'm I can't think what it would be like to have Bob Metcalf as a boss. So how was that? How did that work out? Uh, he was the best boss I've ever had. I mean, imagine someone who who could convince you to do anything and didn't take fools lightly. So if he thought someone was on the wrong course, he let everybody know through his humor. Um, he was very determined in direction. He also wore his heart on his shoulder. He he he. You know, some people are introspective and they're more private. Bob is uh, more extrospective and he can really read other people. He can see where they're coming from. He can, he can get them to think of his idea and make it think it was their own. So he was very skilled. So, so some people you see as sort of unidirectional, right? They're transmit only. What you're saying is he could actually, he did both well. Yeah, he did. He did both directions and he, he, he had a, a spark in him that you just, he cared about you. Oh, not, not, nice joke on the spark, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I mean, that. That's a bit early, right? I thought you designed it later on. <laughs> yeah, he, just a remarkable man to, to work for. So, um, you, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned a few people, right? Can you just give me, like, talk about a couple of these people and like what they're, you know, what, what things stand out to you about working with them? I mean, I know there was a lot of them, but like, just give me just a couple of them. Well, um, Butler Lampson uh, had his finger in everything at Park and in the System Development Division in a way. He uh, was beyond uh, brilliant. He would kind of like, I, I hate to say it, but kind of like Christ and his disciples. <laughs> uh, everyone looked up to Butler. Um, because his word was usually right. And he also spoke faster than most people could think. Um, so Butler was a real, uh, a real leader and, and, and charm person there. Uh, Chuck Thacker, who I worked with very closely, uh, was also brilliant. Um, Chuck could design you know, 10, 10 hardware circuits, probably the time it would take a normal mortal to design two. And he wrote software um, and he, he, he really, his background was as a physics major, so if he if he were tired designing circuits and stuff, he would ask you physics puzzles. <laughs> no, I actually I actually am a physics minor. I went I went to college planning to be a physics major before I figured out it wasn't going to pay. Uh, but I'm one of those strange people who likes quantum mechanics. Uh, indeed, yeah. So I I have I have my men's books up here. So ooh, there, ooh, there are so many personalities. So he was he was an awesome lecturer. Oh, yeah. Some of the stories about him are just wonderful. So Bob Taylor, you know, was what really made the place click. He had hired all the great people and uh, he really also really cared about people and, and he had a very strong vision about what should be done, that, that computers should communicate. Um, Bob, uh, again, he, he had very high standards and if you didn't meet them, um, he would let you know. So uh, how part, far up the stack did Bob really work? Because I think what you told me is the person you just told me about had the overall vision of communicating. And there's yeah, a little yeah. some stuff between did Bob, did Bob Taylor work or Bob Metcalf? Uh, Bob Metcalf, right? Because there's this there's this huge vision of all the things that have to come together. And well, Bob, it's difficult for anyone to understand all of it. Yeah. Bob cut his teeth uh, designing um, uh, you know, imp interfaces for the ARPANET. I mean, when he came to, to Xerox Park in 1972, uh, without his PhD at that point. <laughs> He, his first job was to build uh, an imp that was the message processor for the ARPANET to connect the Max computer that they had designed at Park to the ARPANET. So he had a lot of, and his whole PhD thesis was in packet communication. 
so he had bought into the whole communication uh, scenario and you know he had visited uh, Hawaii and the lower net people and he when he came you know when Butler said it's we need to network but Taylor said we need to network these computers Bob said well I've got the network <laughs> I've got the simple approach they said it has to fit on one board so his thing was well, these people I'm like working with have a problem to solve and I have the key I know how to build the key part that lets them do their job yeah yeah so Bob uh, you know along with uh, David Boggs uh, uh, Bob was not really an analog engineer. He was more of a system engineer and a, and a software guy, architect. Uh, so he met Dave Boggs there at Park, and together they they prototyped the first card, wrote the first uh, microcode for the card, and got it up and running. Uh, ran at three megabits per second, and uh, it, it worked from day one. I mean, part and of Bob the explain to me why why that number made sense. It was because it, it saved them, I think, another clock circuit on the board. Well, that that's become a bit of a legend. I, you know, I, I'm. I have the card and believe me, there's room in the card for a clock circuit that it really has more to do with, um, there wasn't a lot of bandwidth in the Alto. The, this oh. remarkable thing about the Alto is the screen took up two thirds of the memory bandwidth, only about three megabytes per second and half the memory. Um, so there really wasn't a lot of bandwidth. So, and in the microcode task scheme, uh, three megabits per second and the 20 microsecond latency could just be handled. So it was just barely doable what the Alto was capable of doing. So, you, so your argument is that's a good reason, but the actual fact is it was enough. It, it was enough. It was so fast. I mean, Bob will tell you that technically it ran at 2.94 megabits per second and the difference was the ARPANET, but of course, no one really filled it up to three megabits per second because the typical transfer rate between two Altos was on the order of you know, maybe 100 kilobits per second, maybe a peak of 300 kilobits per second. So if you had 10 people all using the network at once, maybe you would fill it up, but that didn't happen. So it was just a perfect match for the environment. What was, you know, what were the key things that, that you were there for, right? What were the things that you look back and, and say, well, that was cool, I got to do? For my, for my well, for my work at Xerox, it was, we were, I had the chance to, basically, you know, come up with the commercial implementation of the Ethernet, the very first commercial implementation. So the way it was working is it wasn't like, let's go design an Ethernet interface for a VAX or a DEC machine or a Nova machine. They, Boggs did design Ethernet uh, network for the Nova, the sold a new machine, Tracy Kidder machine, because they had a lot of Novas there at Park initially. But the objective was not- how, how, did the Nova, how did the Nova fit with the Alto? Was it the newer and better one? The Alto Second. was the experiment. The Alto was it. The Alto was the sort of experimental, and the Nova was the production. Or how did no, they no, no, no. The, no, the they had an Ethernet. Uh, Dave and and Bob designed an Ethernet interface for both the Alto oh. and the Nova, and the Nova uh, Ethernet card was used as a gateway. So they would use the Nova to connect multiple Ethernets together. Okay. Um. So they, the um. When we went to, to you know to commercialize it um. It wasn't just designing a controller for a certain system. It was, oh, we need to design a whole better Alto. You know, this this was a nice system, but it wasn't perfect. It was designed in only four months. It's got a lot of hiccups and issues, and Hang on. It would be four faster. months. So, so Chuck you Thacker designed the first personal computer in four months. Chuck, Chuck Thacker and Butler Lampson and Ed McCray did that. That's what they say. Yes, and and then they had to make some prototypes, and they used a, another part of Xerox to build out this pre-production, but. Uh, so this mentality, this ability, you know, how can we transfer this to and make it, you know, product ready? So, well, let's build a whole new workstation. So the plan was to build a better Alto and Chuck Thacker, it was called the D0 for the first display word processor. So Chuck would design the whole processor in conjunction with engineers and El Segundo. And Roy August, myself and Ron Crane would design the Ethernet card. I don't have it because it turns out that that system is sometimes referred to as a second system syndrome. You try so hard to make it better that it's so complex, it's got bugs and issues. And he just, he'll say it wasn't a commercial success as being very, but it, it was targeted for both an engine and a laser printer and as a workstation. So the workstation guy said, it's too expensive. Oh, oh, oh you, you, you had that problem. You, you had the trying to solve too many different masters. Yes, we had that problem. And I learned a kid right out of school, you know, seeing the processor run into this, these problems. And, you know, it, 
Chuck later admitted he didn't follow Maxwell. You know, he didn't do good DC uh, static timing analysis. It was very complex. But we actually had the, the 10 megabit Ethernet controller working in the lab in, in 1978. So 10 megabits per second running in the lab between two D zeros in 1978. Um, and it, it worked fine, uh, but that system didn't make it to market. And what happened at that point is Chuck, who has, I mean, sorry, Bob, who has an entrepreneur aspect to himself, actually uh, left Xerox in late 78, because he said, look, <laughs> this was supposed to take two years. You know, they, they, these guys, the Alpha guys did it in four months. You know, why, why did it take more than two years? It's, and he wasn't willing to wait around for the next two years, which Bob Belleville became my boss and we designed Xerox Star, which did ship in 1981 with an Ethernet. That became the first commercial 10 megabit Ethernet. But Bob was not patient enough to <laughs> wait. He needed to go change the world. So he, he knew that um, Gordon Bell at DEC knew all about the Alto and the Ethernet. So he went to go consult with Project Mac at MIT and with Gordon Bell. Um, and that, that made Ethernet successful because Gordon Bell then contacted Xerox executives and said, could you please open it? Let's, let's work on it together. You know, you, you know Xerox, you, you don't want to get in the business of making Ethernet controller cards and transceivers. Let's do I, 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 want, I want what you have. <laughs> but Gordon Bell was so instrumental in the success of Ethernet by doing that. So here we were, you know, we had designed a working card, but then the system didn't ship. By the way, it did actually ship in small numbers. Xerox announced the 5700 electronic copy or laser printer, I'm sorry. And you know, two hundred thousand dollars. No one bought them. <laughs> it it just wasn't ready yet for. Now we, for the Xerox Star, we we had a low cost laser printer that you could attach to it. So, I mean, most people um, are stunned to know that laser printers go back that far because we tend to think of them as coming after dot matrix and oh. um, ink printers. And you go, you know, the technology has been around for a while. I guess Xerox made its made it start being a copy machine. Oh, Gary Starkweather and Ron Ryder, they built this machine called Ears, which had you know, a character generator and a full one page per second, uh, high resolution laser printer. We were all using that at Xerox Park in 1970, well, five, I mean, 76. I would print documents with four and alphabet, four and fonts on it. People would go, how the hell did you make that? <laughs> you know, it was, uh, so, so um, I, ha I have a note here about an electric story that you've threatened to tell us. Um, oh, oh, yeah. So, um, so I, I joined in July '76. Ron Crane, the analog expert, joined a little bit a month before me. We became close friends. Um, I came into work on January 5th, 1978. A little late because we stayed up till two or three a.m. Right? You know, we're going to change the world. We didn't. We, we didn't realize we weren't a startup company with options. You know, we would work literally until two or well, three in the morning. To some extent, the people who are most fun to work with don't work for the money, right? They work yeah. for the belief and the passion. Oh, we were so passionate. Um, I, I would um, ride my bike uh, to park uh, and back to the hotel. I mean, the hotel is staying in, and I'd have to drive by a cemetery at two at two a.m. in the morning. <laughs> that was pretty spooky. Um, but yeah, we stayed up all night. So I came in late that morning and there was a ladder up in the ceiling and Ron Crane up on the ladder uh, pulling, pulling uh, transceivers uh, down from the ceiling. And I, you know, what happened? Well, if you live here in the Bay Area, you know that electrical storms are not very common. But lightning had struck uh, the hill or near one of our buildings and the ethernet was between two buildings. And oh, oh, oh you had you had that problem. So lightning strike between the buildings. <laughs> yeah, there was a voltage difference, and it wasn't that shouldn't have happened. But one of the technicians found a wrench uh, still connected to the transceiver, touching the cable tray, and so you know there was a clear connection between the transceiver and earth ground here, and another one up there, and so some large voltage on the cable blew out about a dozen transceivers. And that day, of course, IBM executives were to come to see how great the internet was. <laughs> of course, right. it's, of course. it's always the day of the demo <laughs> that things start to explode. Yeah, exactly. There, there was a similar story where uh, on the Alto, they were gonna have executives come watch and they installed the 33rd uh, ether network, you know, behind gateways. And, and the, so what, the field was always- did anyone actually ever install the 13th 
or, or did, did you just skip that one over? Oh, no, they installed it. I mean, there is actually, you know... 13 being the unlucky number. Yeah, the Alto didn't have enough memory. The Star didn't have enough memory. They only had a table, a five-bit table for the number of networks. You know, you know, Park definitely did the first internet, you know, the ability to you know, park universal packet pup format to send stuff over regardless of what the network is. But there was actually, uh, there's a story about how the MAC address got so large. So the Alto here has-, has I, I was a, just about to ask that, right? Okay. How, how limit, it became that particular size. Limitation story. So the Alto here had an eight bit, uh, serial number and then an 8-bit network number. And Hang on. So you weren't planning to build more than 256 of them? Yeah, networks. No. They, well, there were there was only a, well, there was only one at Park for many years until it, it, there became three, um, and then then eventually, like I said, there were more than 32. Um, but one day, apparently, uh, someone moved an Alto from one building, i.e., network, to another, and in that other network. Two altos had the same serial number. <laughs> How long did it take to work that out? Uh, oh, they're pretty smart. Probably in less than a day. Um, in fact, I think it had the serial number for Max, the main uh, file server at the time. So they realized. So, wait a minute. So they plugged it in, and all of a sudden, the file server went to, went out to lunch. Yeah. So all of a sudden, people realized that uh, no, we need to. You know, we, we have a management problem of numbers and we need to make the field bigger. So when- yeah. And unfortunately, of course, you wouldn't have had any of these nice monitoring tools that we get used to. No, uh, they're, they're, well, every, you can see everything on the network. So in that sense, it yeah. was not too hard. Um, there was no encryption, uh, one of the faults of the ethernet. And Ed, Ed Taft, by the way, who was the mastermind behind um, behind PUP and IFS uh, and these tools, he, he sent a mail message noting- and Just for those that, who don't follow quite so much, that is the precursor protocols to all the internet protocols that's conceived, correct? Yeah, yeah, and Ed Taft and Dave Boggs and, and Bob did a first version, but they uh, he sent this apologetic message out saying, you know, we have kind of have protections, but you realize that anyone can read anything that goes by in your out. <laughs> so look out. And, you know, and, and we're, People from the outside, ARPANET can get inside. So it was a scramble. I assume you didn't explain that in great detail to the military type people <laughs> who would have been a bit concerned. No. So, but anyways, back to the story then. So when the when we were going to productize the Ethernet, it actually changed names. Uh, you know, this was Xerox's thing, and it was called the Xerox wire. There was the idea that you would have an information outlet in the wall, and it was going to be, and Xerox was going to own it, they thought at that point. And the target speed was, uh, well, the official speed was going to be 10 megabits per second. Uh, Bob Metcalf wanted to push things like he always pushed everything. And so the internal speed was 20. But as part of that design, um, the design had a 32-bit MAC address. And um, when we, when people started working with DEC uh, in particular, um, they and Will Crowther at Xerox Park said, I think we need to go to you know, bigger numbers. <laughs> so people were making calculations if every computer with a kilogram would be the mass of the earth. So, you know, so it ended up at 48 bits. I mean, it's, it's, it sounds like one of those in the middle things we've seen a few times. It's like, well, I've got 32, I'd like 64, but 48's right in the middle. So why don't we compromise? Yeah. Well, right now I've, I've been interviewing people for the paper I'm working on and people are saying, I wish it was 64. <laughs> If you think about this as the start of your career, right? What's a couple of the key things you took with you as you moved on? Uh, well, I think one of the key things I learned uh, at, at Xerox was that it's really important to listen to everybody. Um, sometimes, you know, you might get disillusioned or there might be problems. Frequently, a solution or an insight to a problem exists in your organization with people who are there. And if you just take the time to listen to everybody, you're amazed to find out that there's a potential solution out there. It's just that you couldn't see it. You have that to of course, listen. That, of so course, that's has been a problem in Silicon Valley with so many people who think they have the answer. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So we, we, we have the strong opinions and the great talent, but it's hard to have that. Plus what you said with Metcalf, where you had the ability to be visionary and brilliant, but also listen, right? That's a rare combination. Yeah, yeah. You really have to sit and listen. Um, and I, I guess one of the things that I learned probably between Xerox and, and, and Sun was um, never assume that you'll get everything finished uh, over the weekend. Uh, 
And in fact, it's more likely that when you come back with your colleagues on Monday that the requirements will have changed. So all the work you did over the weekend is not important anymore. <laughs> um, you know, you, we tended to be into this mindset that, uh, oh, I, if I, you know, okay, I'll go to all the meetings on, on Monday through Friday, but I'll have time this weekend to, to get the job done. But that doesn't work. And this is a big leading question, but, you know, how did Ethernet impact the world? I mean, it's a huge question, but it's again, it's one of those top level, right? If you look back, what do you think is sort of the consequences of the work that got done then? Well, it's, it's incalculable. I mean, I, I like to say that every um, computer to human, human to computer, human to human communication today goes over an ethernet at some point. I mean, clearly they, the way we're talking is over, is over a lot of ethernet links. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Bob, people back then, tended to want to do something complex so they could impress their friend. But, you know, Bob understood people that people would make things too complex and there'd be weird problems in corner cases. So just keep it simple. He had a very famous uh, phrase, which was reliability means not having to say you're sorry. And, yeah, and so by that. keeping the hardware as simple as possible, you know, what could be more simple than just speak up? You know, if you want to send a packet, just start talking and, you know, so and deal with it. Deal with the issues. So it's a bit I mean, like the lesson for documents and products and standards, which is you're not left until you're not done until there's nothing left to take out. Yeah, exactly. So just speak up. And if 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 two people you know speak at the same time, well, just back off, you know, back off. <laughs> and back off randomly if you can, you know. So very simple idea. So it worked on a cable. Uh, it obviously worked in switches, and the very first switches that were built weren't full throughput. You know, and so if the microcode ran out of resources, it knew it could just drop a packet and the whole thing would still work because a reliable transport protocol above would go fix it up. Yes, so, I, I wrote a bunch of code on, the, on those devices, be, be it microcode from NPUs or be it just forwarding code in like a 68302. Yeah. The, the protocol set was forgiving of the reality of the time. Yeah, so it, it gave hardware people a break. You know, you didn't have to be perfect. You know, switches are very hard to design. The technology wasn't quite ready initially. You have to break packets up into pieces, put them in memory, reassemble them, and blah, blah, blah. You know, just, but that eventually, we eventually got there. So Ethernet, you know, I, Bill Joy, who I worked with, dear friend at, at Sun Microsystem, had a phrase that I always remembered, which was, technology speaks for itself. Technology speaks for itself. Sometimes we think that you know it's all business, and certainly business plays a big role. Bob will tell you about the importance of business and Ethernet uh, and the ecosystem. But sometimes, if the basic technology is good, it just lives on its own. It speaks for itself. That's the thing I take away, which is you're not building you're not building it so you can see it. You're building it so it can get used. Right. Right. Yeah. You're you're building it. Well, people talk, and computers need to talk. It's that simple. Um, I think maybe I, the other I, point you got into there was it was built deliberately open-ended. So it wasn't, it's going to do this thing alone. It's like, we're going to enable these set of things and people can go and do what they want with it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and people, because of its simplicity, people could try to take it different directions. And if they got burned, they got burned. You know, they gave them a little bit. So I, I've got some a few pieces of hardware to show you if you want. Please. Okay, so uh, on, on the... Well, let's talk about the, the Alto first. I mean, just really briefly, um, here's the uh, storied Alto. So a half a megabit display, a bitmap display, uh, really audacious position they took because it actually took up half of main memory, 128 kilobytes, kilobytes, an eighth of a megabyte of main memory, um, took up half of it, two thirds of the memory bandwidth. Everyone thought they were just off the, why make, go through much work to make something look pretty? You know? Okay, well, uh, you know, keyboard and mouse as we know it, um, uh, the ethernet, you know, transceivers that connected to it, um, three megabit there, um, the two and a half megabyte uh, removable disk pack, which was kind of neat if you're alto every how much? How, Like how big, two and a half megabytes? Half megabytes, yeah. Wow. Well, a lot bigger than the 120 kilobytes of main memory. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget Don Knuth coming and going with his uh, disk pack at Xerox Park. Um, uh, so, you know, all, all the pieces we know of a, of a PC as we knew it in the 1980s and 90s. And the remarkable thing about it was that it was a, a 
a micro uh, CPU was divided up into micro tasks. And so uh, the display, the disk and the ethernet microcode actually did all the transfers from little tiny buffers to main memory. So this was actually the, the first commercial ethernet car that Dave Boggs and Bob Metcalf designed. Not, I'm sorry, not commercial, the first one used at Park. It's, it's ginormous. Um, yeah, so it, it, looks, it looks big, but hey, this only contains um, a, a 32 byte buffer and it's half duplex. So the ethernet's half duplex, it either sends or receives. So this is only half duplex. So in addition to that, Let's just say you need a whole bunch more cards because <laughs> that's not all. So you need an ALU, right? So here's yeah. the ALU. It's divided up among the various uh, I/O devices. It's a microcoded machine. Hold, remember what microcode is. You need a control store, double width card. So you see now we're starting to get there. This took more work than what meets the eye. Uh, you need a, a memory controller borrowed from the Max computer they had designed, and you need. 17 of these that used Intel 1103s, one kilobit DRAMs, one kilobit. The first DRAMs ever commercially produced. They were a little leery of using core. Probably a good idea. So you needed 17. Yeah, probably a good idea. So, you know, you basically have got a half rack here yep. of, tw of uh, 25 or so cards uh, left to right. And so that's what it took to get you your personal workstation. So it, it also cost in today's dollars probably about forty to fifty thousand dollars. So about half to a third of the price in Sunnyvale. So imagine when you join Xerox, like I did, they give you half of a home in your office. <laughs> so and, that and, was, and tell you to be to be kind to it, and please don't please don't break it. If one broke, you just took the disc out and plugged it into another one. So over here we have the the you know the second system commercialization, which is the Xerox Star. Uh, you know, it had a- Another famous name. Yeah, it had a 7.8 uh, um, megahertz clock, a, a bit faster, 137 nanosecond cycle time. This guy was 170 nanoseconds. Um, but the same things, keyboard display, uh, the cards, you get more, a little more compression. So um, the same idea, Butler Lampson came up with an idea of managing the tasks differently. And the Alto, if you were had microcode, if you ran too long, you could screw everybody else up. <laughs> and Butler Lamson said, why don't we just give everyone a fixed time slot with the microcode? So the ethernet code will always know it's gonna get a time slot and a certain latency. And that was a brilliant idea. So this was the, this is the ethernet and the laser printer card for the Xerox star. So the top half was the ethernet part that, that Roy August, I'm sorry, that I and Ron Crane designed. And the bottom half drives the laser printer, uh, which could be, a low end razor, uh, laser printer. But again, that's not the whole thing. You need CPU card. <laughs> so here's the CPU card based on AMD 2901, 16 bit, just like the Alto was 16 bit. Uh, here's the control store now. So if just wave your hand over this, convert the control store into SRAM and convert this into a 32 bit microprocessor and you have risk. <laughs> and, today, and today that would be about like yay big. Uh, it's some quarter of my phone in my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the hardware toys. So can you tell us a little bit about the project you're working on? Because I, I've heard a little bit about it and I think it's really interesting. Uh, the, we're coming up to the 50th anniversary of the creation of the Ethernet, timed off of Bob Metco's Bob Metcast memo, uh, where he kind of coined the term Ether Network. By the way, there was a nice, uh, she gave an example of his humor. The very first two altos that the ethernet was installed in outside of the prototype were, were called Michelson and Morley because they had, <laughs> they, had, because they had granted youth of the term to Bob because they didn't need, the, they had proved it doesn't exist. So then Bob could use the term ethernet. So that was- that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty inside joke. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it's the 50th anniversary and uh, we wanted, uh, we one of the IEEE person was looking uh, to understand a little bit more of the history and said, well, you know, not much has been written about the work on the 10 megabit part before DEC, Intel, uh, AMD, MosTech, uh, Interland, Excellent, all these other companies got involved. I mean, the so kind of what happened there? So I've decided to go back and you look online, not a lot 
has written about it. So I said, let's write that up. And there is, there is the book about three com that I've read. Yes, there's a three com book. There's the Triumph of Ethernet book, which is by Berg, which is a great book on the business success of Ethernet. But there's not a lot of technical history. And so I, what I've realized, I can't really just start with 10. So I'm going to look at the 10 year from 1973 to 1983 from a technical perspective. When do you think you'll finish? <laughs> well, the project got bigger. So now I don't think it'll be done until early next year. Okay, so um, is there any sort of last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Because I mean, clearly we could, I, I could happily talk to you for another like four or five days, <laughs> but that's sort of the computer history museum oral history. Um, any final thoughts about the whole evolution of ethernet and how it's affected you and the rest of the world? As a combination between the fundamental simplicity of it, um, you know, Bob, Bob Metcalf's uh, uh, tutelage over it over all these years, um, and 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 people's desire to make communications that 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 work and that are easy um, has enabled. I mean, just beyond anyone's imagination, the entire world to be interconnected for better or worse. <laughs> no, that, I mean, yeah. that I think is, that is where satisfaction comes in to go back and go, oh, that, that was really good. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's not to do with how much money you made. It's like, oh, I got to contribute to that. Yeah, no, you can't, you, 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 you can't take your dollar bills to your grave with you, right? But you can take your good memories and the feelings of success. Robert, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation. And as I said, I'd happily do this for another five days, but I'm not sure our viewers would watch. Um, I do look forward to when your project finishes because we would like to cover it. So look, thank you very much for your time and hopefully we'll get together in person sometime soon. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Tune in to hear other voices of Ethernet as we continue to document the evolution of Ethernet since 1973 and explore where the technology story might go next. Thanks for joining.